Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself. Now, if you've been following this series of interviews with Bob Moses, we're going to jump ahead now and kind of have a more overall thematic conversation, but Bob's promised to come back and we're going to pick up the story from 1964 on in, in detail. Um, but for now, joining us again in the studio is Bob Moses. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. Hi. So one more time, Bob's an educator, civil rights activist during the 1960s. He was a field secretary for SNCC. He was one of the main organizers of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. He was a very outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. And thanks for joining us again. And mm -hmm. I should add, you're the founder of the Algebra Project, which when you come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about. Okay. But yeah. I, I want to talk kind of much more broadly. Yeah. Do you think, going right back to voter registration, uh, the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party. Like, if you register, if the issue is to register people for vote, and, if, you know, the final analysis, if there's going to be a change of who has power, it's, in the United States, it's going to happen through elections in some form or another, that, that, that the movement for, for black liberation in the United States, and frankly, for people's liberation in the United States, has been so wedded to the Democratic Party and has not yet found a way either to successfully wage a real struggle within the Democratic Party, so it isn't, as it is now, mostly run by Wall Street, um, and develop some kind of independent politics. Because if the equation is just the, you know, corporate Democrats versus corporate Republicans, and I'm not saying there's no difference, there is a difference, but we're in Baltimore, we're in a state that's primarily Democratic, and, and you know, Baltimore is one of the cities in the country that has some of the worst chronic poverty and the worst crime and some of the worst social problems in a city council that's mostly black. So you know, some of the achievements has also given rise to you know, what Glenn Ford and some others talk about, you know, a, you know, a black elite that's emerged, has taken advantage of some of the victories of the civil rights movement. But for you know, the majority of African Americans, life has changed a little, but certainly not a lot. And uh, does there not need to be some reckoning with a different kind of politics? Yeah, so, so this is, um, um, so if you look at, um, there's data out that the Southern Educational Foundation has put out, um, a, a particularly striking uh, data set which is looking at the top quartile of the economic distribution versus the bottom quartile around the question of what percent got, actually got BAs, right? Not who went to college, but who actually got a BA. So from 1970 to 2010, 40 years, right, the percent of the top quartile that got a BA doubled from 40 to 80 percent. The percent of the bottom quartile went from seven to nine. It didn't budge, right? So the country has abandoned the bottom quartile of its economic distribution, right? And so that includes most of black people, right? Um, Although so it's important to add not only black people, because uh, well, white people the have issue. been abandoned as well. It's the bottom well. quartile. There are more yeah. white people in the bottom quartile than black people, right. but most of the black people are in the bottom quartile right, right. Uh, on this issue, right? So, um, so, the, so the issue is um, whether um, there's going to be a force. It, it has to be a we the people force. Right. Um, that's. I mean, you have these three forces, right? You have the federal force, right? You have the states' rights force, and you have the we the people force in terms of the constitution, right, of the country. So, what would, unless there's a we the people force that actually gets um, organized, not just mobilized, but organized um, around these issues, um, there is no. I don't see any way in which we um, um, move from the current situation, which really is the elites, both Democrats and Republicans, um, that are really running a government that serves their interests. Right? Um, so, but, so how that happens, um, so there is going on in Mississippi um, this summer this ballot initiative um, 
you know, um, on the issue of education, I mean, one thing we could say is that the, the movement in the 60s got Jim Crow, this slavery by another name, out of three distinct areas of American life. Public accommodation, access to the vote, and the uh, National Democratic Party structure. We didn't get it out of education. Right? So um, there is this ballot initiative in Mississippi uh, to fully fund um, education in Mississippi. They need to collect uh, a couple of hundred thousand signatures. Um, so that at least is a, a, a small beginning around the Missis in Mississippi around this We the People force. Um, there is the question whether, I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? So, you know, at the National Democratic Convention in 64, when MFDP went and challenged the Mississippi regulars, Johnson was not afraid of King, right? So King was going to testify, um, but it was when Fannie Lou Hamer took the stand to testify that Johnson decided... This is testifying before the Credentials before Committee at the Democratic Party Convention? Yes. And King actually agrees to the deal that's offered at that point, that, to take a couple of seats at large but leave the white delegation alone. Yes, so King, King, um, King tells the delegation that if he was in their shoes, he would probably vote like they voted. Which was right. not to accept the compromise. Which was not to accept it, right? But he's taking the stance that he has to look f out uh, for the party, for the country, right? And it's his fear so was Goldwater could be elected if 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 this was allowed to go through. Well, I, I think actually his fear was that Ruther would withdraw his support from SCLC. I mean, I was in the meeting when uh, Ruther from Walter, the United Auto Workers. Yeah, so Walter Ruther is head of the United Auto Workers. Hubert Humphrey and Bayard Rustin come to deliver the news. So uh, King, Andy Young, Mrs. Hamer, Ed King, Aaron Henry, myself, right, are in the room and they're delivering the news. And what Walter Ruther tells King is that you you are risking the support of the uh, that we have been giving you. The right? union movement. The union movement has been giving you. Right. So they were pulling all the strings, right, that just they could. Just quickly, just, if, just we, we touched on this in an earlier episode, but just to make sure I'm framing this correctly. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came and said, we should be the delegation from Mississippi in 1964. What there is is a Dixiecrat, white, racist delegation. Um, party leadership offered this compromise, which you could have two at-large non-voting seats. But Fannie Lou Hamer and the others in the leadership of the Freedom Democratic Party said no. And, and part of the story, which I had never heard before, is there, you actually have a sit-in uh, right in the convention. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, right. Uh, yes. So um, we, need to, we need to express ourselves, right, uh, publicly um, about what it is, how we feel is about this, this. This is after King has said he would accept a compromise. You then have a sit-in. Yeah, so what happens is um, the convention is about to open, and just before the night the convention opens, we have this meeting. Ruth and Byron and Humphrey come and meet and give us the deal, right, that this is what's going to go down, right? And what we say is, well, the delegation is going to have to meet, right, around this issue, right? But the delegation, the meeting for the delegation is to be the next day. Right? But the convention's going to open that night. And so um, some of us, in the, some of the people in the delegation and myself, uh, we get together and decide that we're going to have a sit-in that night. Right? Uh, and so I go around and I get, um, there are few blacks from the Midwest who are delegates. Right? Um, and they loan me their badges. And I find a side door. Right? And um, we begin, I just make several trips in and out. With until we several go. trips with the same in badges. And, yes, and with the same badges. We just have three or so badges. So, mm -hmm. so we're taking them in a few at a time, right? And then when we get enough, they actually go and sit in the Mississippi seats, right? Uh, and of course, the white people from Mississippi, there weren't that many of them there, actually, right? Um, they leave, right? 
and so we have our sit-in that night. Uh, the next day when we have the big uh, meeting. Aren't you at some point you're surrounded by FBI. Well, and, what happens yeah. is they don't bother us that night, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, they're really taken by surprise. And so what are you going to do? Because all the cameras are right on there, right? So y you can't do anything in front of all these TV cameras, right, that are right looking at this sit-in, right? And so uh, the next day we have our big meeting with the whole delegation and uh, the Democratic uh, leadership, right, coming to convince the delegation. So part of when I get a chance to talk, I ask King um, if he agrees with nonviolent direct action um, that we did last night, right? And so uh, King has to agree, right, that this is okay to have uh, nonviolent direct action. So the next night we, we repeat it, but they're ready for us. They've removed all the seats, and they have a cordon of FBI agents surrounding. They're protecting the area, right? These empty chairs. They, and, no, no chairs. They took oh, all the, the chairs away, <laughs> just the space, right? And they're sitting around, this, the, they're standing around the space. And so we have our little prayer circle, right, um, next to the Mississippi space. So. Um, actually, we had a Bayard Rustin in 64 brings King and Andy Young and Ella Baker to Mississippi uh, to talk about this, right? And the question is whether King is going to support us at the convention. And Bayard wants to know whether we are going to actually recruit the nationalists in Philadelphia and New York and storm the convention. Right? And if we are, King shouldn't support us. Right? And we're not interested in doing that, but we do say that if we, we're not saying we won't do direct action, but if we do, it will be the delegation, right? that they're entitled to express themselves in that way at the, at the convention. So all of that had been agreed upon in Mississippi before we actually go to Atlantic City. And you could say that kind of deal or compromise in the final analysis with the leaders of the union movement, with the leaders of the Democratic Party, is kind of right to this day. There has yet to be uh, a, a way for the movement to find a way to, one, fight corporate leadership of the Democratic Party without electing Republicans and right. constantly in that bind. But you do have, as I say, like places like Baltimore, where there isn't a Republican, you can't elect a Republican as a dog catcher here, but there's no serious challenge here to the machine either. Yeah, no, and I think, so we got our first glimpse, but you know, Chakwe Lumumba ran for mayor. Jackson, Mississippi. In Jackson, Mississippi. And, and just died passed. a few weeks ago. He just ago. died, right. But he ran as a Fannie Lou Hamer Democrat, right. And he ran a, a grassroots campaign. He actually had people knocking on doors, right, because he didn't have any real money. And they put a lot of money in another candidate to try to beat him, but he actually ran. And so, he won. And he won, right. Um, so, so that's part of the question, whether, and you're not looking at the presidential level, you're looking at the grassroots level, whether there will be in the coming say, next 25 years, right? Some breakthroughs in cities. Yes, a real resurgence, right, at the grassroots level uh, where people decide. And it's got to, it can't be just black people, right? It's got to be working class people, right? Working class people have got to figure out where their bread and butter lies, right? Because right. it, it doesn't lie in racial subordination. All right, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So this is the end of this series of, of Reality Asserts Itself, but it's, it's just barely a beginning of this conversation. And Bob's, as I said, will come back soon, and we'll pick up on it then. So thanks very much for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself and the Real News Network.